Well, I hope everybody is starting out for the starting off with a really good Monday. I got a few more little goodies to show you today, and I hope you enjoy these and maybe a surprise or two. And so I'm going to jump right on in with a surprise. Oh, hey, this is a 1989 oh, yeah, model. Now, anybody that has worked very much on me will come in there and see this kind of thing. And I remember this thing was full of cool. that it needed a head gasket and he did not want to spend the money on a head gasket and so he wanted to know if he could donate it to the college. It was an 89 big Bronco with a 5.8 in it and so he, he donated it and I noticed that it didn't run all that great and I also noticed that the water pump was leaking a little bit and I also noticed that when you let it run for very long even if it was full of water or coolant or whatever when you started up it didn't run very long. It was about the time it started to warm up and the thermostat would open, it would start doing what you just saw it doing on that video. Okay, and I hope I didn't, you know, have the sound didn't bother you while I was talking over it. But the point is, uh, looking at that, you would swear this thing had a blown head gasket. But that's not what was wrong with it. And the proof's in the pudding. What the guy had done is he assumed that because this 351 Windsor looked like a 302, that it had the same firing order as a 302. Well, on the uh, plenum it said plain as a 5.8. And I didn't pay a lot of attention to the numbers that were written on this distributor cap, but I did notice this funky burn pattern on the inside. And I saw him sitting here one day and I says, uh, well, that Bronco's been out there for a while and he probably needs his spark plugs pulled out and uh, cleaned, you know, because whenever you start one and don't let it warm up and drive it around the light, it tends to foul the plugs after you do that too many times. And so what we did was we went ahead and uh, uh, this student was pulling the plugs out. He drove a uh, Ford pickup. And I said, this is about the same engine that's in your truck, isn't it? And he goes, no, mine is a 5 liter and this is a 5.8. In other words, this was a 351 and his was a 302. And so I, I got to think, and I said, wait a minute. And I looked at the distributor cap, and I saw these numbers where this guy had done. Let me make sure that I got my little marker going here. One, eight, okay. Excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was thinking Chevy. One, five, four, two, six, three, seven, eight. Okay, and it rotates in this direction. That's Fine, well and fine, correct. Well, the problem with that is, the th and the ones of you that already know this are already rolling your eyes, the 3.8, I'm sorry, the 5.8 has got a 1372 firing order, not a 1542 firing order. So every other cylinder, you know, is, is different, is moved around on the, uh, because it, it gives it a little more power whenever you build one with that firing order. Of course, the camshaft's got to be different and all that kind of thing. But he had wired this thing up like a 302, and it was 5.8. When I replaced the distributor cap, and with the plugs cleaned and put back in there, and I put the right firing order on it, this thing ran perfect, and it didn't do any of that puking of the coolant at all. Uh, there was another time when I was at the dealer, whenever this uh, guy back there and the, one of the engine mechanics had put uh, had problems with a van that was running a really peculiar way, and he had had the distributor out and all that and bunched some did some work and he put it back in and he had wired that 5.8 up like a 302 and I rolled the scope back there and connected it and every other firing line was really high and I got to look at and oh also it gets better he also had dropped that distributor in 180 out so he put the distributor in 180 out and wired it up like a 302 I don't know which cylinder he started out with number one on but he that thing started up and it ran um, but anyway we had to put the thing back in there with it you know, with the distributor not 180 out, and we had to wire it up with the right fire order, and that fixed his problem. There was a student, and I had this 350 Chevy engine on a stand that I featured in some of these videos, and I would have the guys, I would pull the distributor out, throw the wires in the roll-around cart there, the distributor and the wires and everything, and I would challenge them to see how fast they could find top dead center compression, put the distributor in, and wire it up and get it started. Now, my boy Jimmy, that now works over at the Ford place, could do that in three and a half minutes. I'm talking about from walking up there, 
find and you know pop the number one spark plug out, put his finger in the hole, find the number one top dead center compression, rotate it on around, drop the distributor in there, wire it up and fire it up. That's hard to believe. There was another guy that was kind of goofy that never would have made a good mechanic and he practiced and practiced and practiced and got to where he could do it in about six and a half minutes. As a matter of fact, I've got a video of him doing that on my YouTube channel. His name was D-A-I-G-L-E. You can probably look that up. But the long and the short of it is, uh, this one guy on that 350 didn't understand firing orders, but he saw how the cylinders were numbered, and he wired that 350 up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I don't know which cylinder he started on, but that thing started and ran. It ran like crap, but it started and ran. So you, sometimes we think we know a lot more than we do about how an engine can run and how it can't. You know, of course, you couldn't drive that engine that way, but it just blew me away that he was able to get it started. All right. Now this right here is a bearing noise. Notice how this notice how this works. Out. Let me see if I can get away from this. See if I can make it play. There we go. See that? Now whenever you uh, hear a bearing noise, and I'm going to demonstrate this on my silver pickup one of these days because it's getting it's got a bad bearing on one side in the front, and uh, whenever you turn the wheel to the right, it loads the left wheel more, and the bearing will get louder. If you turn it to the left, it unloads the left wheel, and the noise goes away. That's sort of a little brief uh, demonstration of that. Now this right here was a cream puff I saw the other day, but I want you to notice what we got right here. We have a swamp cooler. Basically, it catches air and it evaporates the water, you know, the evaporating water, and it blows that cool air. From, it's like an evaporator air conditioner, if you use the water, to cool the inside of the car, using the wind that's coming from down the road and all that kind of stuff. That's a pretty cool deal. But one way or another, that was a cool looking ride. I've only seen it once in town, and it was one of those things where I managed to hold my uh, camera up at just the right angle going by and you know tap the uh, shutter release and it was really <laughs> it was a beautiful shot I thought uh, I, w I went on down to the farmer's market and this guy that rides around town with a on his bicycle with a big old camera said that he saw that thing but he didn't have time to get his camera out and take a picture of it you know but uh, look at uh, look at the, the, the white wall tires the fender you got the you got the fender skirts back here you got the white wall you know and the reason those tires had all of that back in the early days, uh, the white wall was uh, so wide, was because the natural color of rubber is, is white. And whenever they vulcanize it, uh, they basically make it black. So they used to just vulcanize the tread, and that would make it last a lot longer. And so the, but they leave the, the rest of the tire that they didn't think needed to be vulcanized, they just leave it white. You know, you can actually research it if you want to. But uh, that's pretty funny. All right. Now then, uh, unless you're somebody that's very familiar with this particular uh, platform, um, you won't be able to answer these questions, to be fair. And so my question is, what year model window are we talking about here? There is only three year models this could be. One of three year models this could be. Uh, this is a Crown Victoria. There's only one of three year models it could be. And there's only one firing order it could have. And um, so rather than keep you in suspense or waste a lot of your time, I'm going to tell you that the reason that I know this is an 81 to an 83 is because it is an EEC-3 system, EEC-3 system. And it does not have anything in the distributor except for a rotor. That's all it's got. Um, the distributor alignment had to be absolutely perfect because the rotor alignment had to be perfect. Now, whenever you change the timing by change, turning the distributor on the ones that you set the timing that way, you're basically changing the relationship between the pickup coil and the reluctor or the points and the cam and that kind of stuff. So that's why the timing changes when you turn the distributor. On this one, and like on a lot of the Jeeps, they have a crank sensor. You cannot set the ignition timing by turning the distributor because all you're doing is altering rotor alignment. Chevy uh, CSFI systems are like that in central select, I mean, sequential electronic fuel injection systems. Uh, so this particular one, you have, if you didn't line the distributor up just exactly right, you would wind up with uh, surges and stuff going down the road because the, uh, if the rotor is not aligned properly, when the timing is advanced when you're at road speed, uh, the, the timing 
will fire the call while the rotor is closer to the uh, spark plug terminal behind the one it's supposed to fire on. And so it'll be firing the wrong plugs whenever the timing is advanced when you're at road speed. Because when you're at road speed, your timing comes up if you're just in a float and you're not accelerating. Your timing is going to be up around 50 degrees before top dead center. See, so the, the little uh, rotor post, uh, I'm sorry, the post that the rotor fires to has got to be right in the middle of that firing window. A lot of people don't understand that. Well, the reason I know this is EEC 3, one reason I know it's EEC 3 just by looking, is it's got this old map barrow sensor. And in order to put this one in self-test, you would have to hook up to that barometric pressure port right there with a hose and pull 10 inches of vacuum on it and hold it for a second. And then when you let off, it would go into self-test and it would start cycling these solenoids right here. You know, click, 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 and then both of them would go together and then it would flash out the code. I built a box when I was at Lincoln Mercury Place in 1984 to check the codes on these and it worked out pretty good. Uh, also, you might notice this one here has got a brown grommet uh, DuraSpark module on it, which is a different module than you would buy. The blue grommet module is the one you buy for the other one. But anyway, this is an 81 to 83. It's got a crank sensor, and this is the crank sensor wire coming up there. The crank sensor wires on these is still blue and gray, just like it was for years on Fords. And I worked on one of these one time that was in a Lincoln. And I've mentioned it before, but after five minutes of driving, it would just buck and snort for a second, and then it wouldn't have any problem for the rest of the day. And everybody ran out of ideas, and I just looked at it, and, I, and for some reason, and it's just, you know, sometimes you just do stuff that leads you to the problem without knowing why you did it. I unplugged the crank sensor wire there, and it was up in this, right up in this area right here. See that big old throttle position sensor connector? Anyway, one of the pins was pushed back part way so that it was barely making contact. I don't know why it was exactly five minutes every time, unless it's a heat cycle thing or something. Uh, another thing that's uh, unique about these old EEC 3 systems that came out back then was that if you were to measure the voltage at this uh, TP sensor, you would find 9 volts for reference voltage instead of 5. Now, in 1984, whenever EEC 4 came out, they went to 5 volts reference voltage, and everybody's pretty much stayed there ever since, except some of the uh, Chryslers that have uh, Hall Effect sensors will have an uh, 8 or a 9 volt feed, I think a 9 volt feed, going to those. Of course, that's not reference voltage, it's a 9 volt feed that you know feeds the Hall Effect part of it. Anyway, so the firing order on this one is going to be 15426378. I used to do this with my students. I'd spit out all these different firing orders. You know, one five four two six three seven eight. If it's a Ford, it's one fourteen twenty five thirty six. And if it's a Chevy, it's one six five four three two V six. And I'd say all that stuff real fast while they were sitting there looking at me. I said, "Okay, there's going to be a pop test on this tomorrow," and then I'd move on. <laughs> I had a great deal of fun with those kids like that. This right here is a set of brake pads, and one of them is worn out really bad. Now you might, you might notice the, the style. These are those European style brake pads that have multiple pistons. Well, whenever you have some locked up pistons on one side, if it's got two sets of pistons, you know, pistons pushing from both directions, uh, you're going to have one. Basically, you got, a lot of times you'll have two pistons. You'll have a, you'll have a piston uh, that's here and here, and then you have another piston that's here and here. And whenever one of the pistons seizes up and doesn't move and the other one does, you'll wind up with the one that does move wearing it like this, and it's going to wind up wearing it crooked. This other one that's working properly is going to like that. Now, if you've got the little floating calipers and you see this, you need to make sure when you pull the caliper off that the little pins will float good. I have seen those that were in bad enough shape that the caliper cage would have to be replaced because that's where the little ca caliper floating pins were. And sometimes they're seized up so bad you'll have to replace the whole caliper cage. When you replace that caliper cage or when you're putting it back on, make sure you use a torque wrench and torque it to specs. Don't just buzz it up with your impact wrench because that's a bad bet. Now your O2 sensors, the very first time I ever worked on a 1994 Thunderbird that had an oxygen sensor code, uh, those that were brand new, they just come out, this one was under warranty, and I got confused about which oxygen sensor was which because of the way the things are numbered. Uh, you know, in my mind, I was thinking that, uh, you know, they would be numbered a certain way, but if you might notice it, oh, the number one bank and the number one oxygen sensor are always on the same side, and so this is one one, and that's one two. See, on this one here, uh, which is your GM and your Chrysler, that's four GM Chrysler, 
when it's an engine that's mounted like that, it's going to have one on the left front. Okay, and that's going to have one two is going to be behind that converter. Okay, two one is going to be here and two two is going to be here. And I was thinking, you know, one one and two one, uh, one one and one two, I was thinking would be these two and two one and two two would be these two. I got so confused on that and I worked on the wrong oxygen sensor for an hour trying to figure out what was wrong with it before I realized I was looking at the wrong sensor. Duh, it's brilliant. So just, this is a, you can actually uh, screen grab this, you know, because I created it more or less, you know, uh, from several different images that I found online and uh, made sure that it was uh, covered most everything. You know, there's going to be some that you don't see here. Uh, but uh, look at all these really carefully. Uh, like I say, blow your screen up, screen grab this by hitting print screen or whatever. And you can save that for future reference. And if you put it in paint and tell it to invert the colors, it'll go. You know, it'll it'll make it where it makes a better, uh, better printable document. You don't want to print like this because you'll have too much black toner you're using. But put it in Microsoft Paint. Uh, do the the square box select select all invert color that'll be at the bottom, and then you can turn this to be uh, black on white instead of white on black. You know. This old Cavalier belonged to a, I mentioned this one time before, but I thought it was so funny. Uh, this friend of mine says uh, his nephew's uh, Cavalier, it was like an 80 model or something, old station wagon, ratty old car, had uh, wouldn't start, and it was at credit union. So when I went over there, and he'd been driving this car for a long time, we actually put a flywheel in it and some other stuff. But we'd been uh, driving this thing, and it was funny, because uh, we opened the hood and found this bird nest in here. Now, I guarantee you these eggs were hard boiled by this time. But the funny thing about it was um, the, the cleaning this, I, I don't know, I guess this goes to show you how long it had been since the guy had opened the hood on his own car. <laughs> but we went ahead and got the bird nest out of there and all that after I took a picture of it. And uh, it turned out that uh, we, we got the thing up in the air and we replaced the, uh, the module and the crank sensor were made together on this one. Now they weren't always on all of these, but the ignition parts on this engine was on the back side of it, I'm talking about this, the transverse engine, but they're mounted, you know, on the back side of the engine where they're aggravating to get to if you don't raise it up on the lift. Well, we put a module and a crank sensor in this thing, a set of spark plugs, and it fired up when, when you find it. The crank sensor had died, but we had to replace the module and the crank sensor just for be belt and suspenders, folks, and it didn't cost all that much to do that. But I never forgot finding these eggs under here. I thought that was hilarious. This busted starter, I got a, one little funny busted starter story that I may have mentioned before, may not have. Uh, whenever I was preparing the trainer vehicles that I had for the students to find bugs on them, I would do stuff, you know, that I knew I'd uh, prepare bugs kind of like I had seen when I was working in the field for years and years and years. And, and so I said, well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to, this is actually a Chevy starter here that's busted. But uh, that Ford uh, Taurus that I had, or the Mercury Sable actually, with a three liter in it. And uh, I says, I'm going to go ahead and uh, take this uh, um, distributor, I mean the coil pack, it had coil pack on it. And I almost crossed the wires on the coil pack so they'll have some, you know, really bad skip to go after. And so I had it up on the lift about waist high, because when I'm working on a vehicle, I guess I like for it to be about waist high on the lift. That way we don't have to bend over, right? So I started this thing up with the plug wires that I had crossed, and as soon as that thing kicked back, it made a loud, ugly noise, and next thing you know, I see I've got a busted starter that's hanging by the wires. <laughs> I just shattered the starter on that thing. But that just goes to show you that crossing the plug wires can cause stuff that you would never believe would happen. But in that case, it didn't, it didn't even start up. It went wah wah poof and says it, you know, it wouldn't, you know, and I'm thinking, what in the world? It wouldn't even spin after that because the starter wasn't grounded because it was just dangling by the wire. And so I went around and I had to put a starter on it. And anyway, I said, well, I don't need to do that again. Of course, that I would uh, actually pull the, uh, the trigger wire back in one of the coils, you know, so that it so that the metal wasn't showing, but it wasn't touching, and it would misfire. And I would have them go look for stuff like that. And then I would, you know, one time at the college, I mean at the school, when I went to uh, Jack, I mean uh, Tallahassee down there to a Ford school, uh, this guy had a module in the back somewhere that was for the airbag, uh, air suspension or something. And he had taken one pin and pulled it out of one cavity and put it in the wrong cavity. 
And uh, if you're not really particular, you will have a hard time finding that unless you're a real stickler for somebody that's going to check the pin out on every connector when you got a problem. And one of the things I learned about these Fords, I got a 98 Ranger trainer vehicle that was nearly brand new when I got it from Ford. Um, you could take that gray and that blue wire, pins 21 and 22, uh, loose from the engine controller, and flip them around backwards and put them in there backwards. And when you're looking at the scan tool, it will you spin it over. It starts to read RPM and then it goes to zero, and you don't get you get a no start. And so I would, you know, I sometimes just to horse around with my students, I would flip them around and see, you know, and then show them that. Uh, here's the other thing, though, if you're ba if you're having to replace the, the let's say the connector on the crank sensor, and you happen to get those uh, wires in that connector transposed so that they connect to the wrong terminals in that little two-pin crank sensor connector, you're going to have one that won't start if you hook those terminals up backwards. And I'm not kidding. That's really, that's really important. This is a timing belt trick uh, that a lot of people use. You know, like, you know, camshafts, I like to try to, because of the, uh, the bump, 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 you know, when you're, if you ever turn, put a, a socket on a camshaft bolt, you know, like one of these right here, and you try to turn that thing, you know how it tries to, it'll be hard and it'll jump, hard and jump. And uh, whenever you're putting a timing belt on, that's annoying as all get out, because what happens is it'll, it'll jump over to the next uh, little cog when you didn't mean for it to. But if you put these belts on here, if you, if you put it on there so that this is lined up, so that your marks are lined up, and you go ahead and put these on there, it cannot do that if you've got these bulldog clips on here. It works pretty good. But there's a lot of little nuances to putting timing belts on because you're, you got to, and time and change, you got to double check everything. One of my guys was putting a, a set of time and change on his uh, 4.6 in his Ford pickup. And he called me over there after he very diligently put them on. He says, look at this. And I looked at it and one of his gears was a tooth off. Now, the thing about it is if you put both of the gears on the, two, on the camshaft, uh, a tooth off, uh, to advanced, I think. Don't don't quote me on this, and don't try this at home. Uh, but it'll have more power. If one of them is a tooth off, but the other one's not, the fuel trims will be like minus 10 on one bank and plus 10 on the other bank. But it'll feel like it's got a lot more power. It's a weird thing. Of course, you know people. Anybody that's fooled with hot rods knows that you can degree camshafts, and you know get yourself yourself some more power. And that's also the principle that makes uh, variable phase camshafts give the engine a little bit more power and make it more efficient and that kind of thing. Of course, on the old Ford Contours, they closed the exhaust valves early so some of the exhaust gas would stay in there and that would make them not need EGR because they were just leaving some of the exhaust gas, gas in there instead of recycling it. You know, another, that's a, another time. <laughs> My son uh, from over in Georgia sent me this picture and you can see what's wrong with this Toyota, you know. I got tickled one time, you know, and I don't have a vendetta against foreign cars. I drove Rabbits and I drove a Nissan one time, a long time, but this one guy that was real f peculiar and particular and curious, he called me and he was wanting to talk to me about uh, this truck that he had bought. And uh, he said that he bought a, uh, I can't remember, something like the Toyota or a Nissan. And he says, uh, he said, I bought one of those because I wanted to get a lot of miles out of it. And, uh, I told him, I said, a Toyota is not any better than any other vehicle. It's just all according to how you maintain it. Uh, you know, there's a, this lady that I know uh, has got a 2008 Explorer uh, that's coming up on 300,000 miles and still drives and looks like a brand new car. We didn't even put spark plugs in it until I had 238,000 miles on it and it never ran bad. You know, so don't tell me that a Toyota is always going to be better than a Ford or a Ford, you know, whatever. Now, there are some... Uh, I love to drive a Chevy because of the way it feels and the way that it accelerates and it's got a really good feel to it. But some of the rear axle components on some of these 1500 series Chevys are just really, really weak compared to some of the others. Uh, on these Toyotas, if you're trying to pull a really heavy load with some of these big Toyota pickups, you'll tear them all to pieces. Furthermore, that one Toyota that had that V8 in it over there, it took us a long bunch of aggravating time to put a starter on that thing because you had to pull the exhaust manifold off on the right head and all that. And that's like a 5.6 hour labor charge if you get it done at a shop or at a dealer. So go figure on that. Also, you know, the ones that the earlier ones, the ones before that, that was an 07. Before that, like in 04 and 05 or whatever, they put the, uh, and some of the Lexuses did too. 
they put the starter under the intake manifold, which is kind of silly. Not all that hard. I'd rather have it under the intake manifold than behind the right hand exhaust manifold, though. Let's be serious. But this ball joint broke, and <laughs> this, this is embarrassing, you know, to see something like that. You might also notice it looks like the window's busted out on here, uh, like this thing's been just totally uh, treated shamefully. But if you treat one shamefully, it's going to, you know, go bad. My buddy Jimmy over there was telling me, and he works at the Ford place. Uh, you know, I, my wife bought a 2016 uh, F-150 with the, it's not an EcoBoost, it's just a little 3.5. Uh, and uh, I asked him about that truck, and he said, my uncle's got one of those, just like she bought, and it's got 350,000 miles on it. He beats the crap out of it. He almost never changes the oil, and it still runs real good. And so, I mean, the point is, a lot of people will have trouble with one particular kind of car. And then they'll say, well, I'm never going to own another whatever, you know. And so, uh, you know, but there's little problems with certain models and certain engine platforms that you do need to know about. Uh, like a lot of these Dodges with these V8s and V6s will have a lot of problems with sludge and so on and so forth. Uh, but when I'm buying anything, I like to buy the one that have already, my, my uh, 07 F-150 has an engine uh, and transmission platform that has been around since 1980. It's got like a AOD, which is 4R70W or whatever, and a, a, a V6, which is going to be the 4.2. And that engine and that transmission has been around for a long time. They got the bugs worked out. So buy one that's the last one they're going to make before they change everything up, and you'll probably get one you won't have a lot of trouble with. Also, regular oil changes are important. Don't ever drive the car unless you're, don't ever start the engine unless you're going to let it completely warm up if you don't want sludge. Uh, and that's an, another important thing, but you know, regular oil changes, always warm the engine up, flush the coolant system, replace the coolant at the re recommended interval and use the right kind of coolant. There's a whole bunch of different things I can tell you, but we'll do that another day. This is the Derelict of the Week Award. This is not far from where I live. There's this Saturn that is sitting out in the backyard. You see the pecan dust on the windows, and it's just sitting there. And I don't know why, there's, it's amazing to me, there's lots of Saturns that are still running around that have a lot of miles on them. You know, Saturn's not really a bad car, but personally I never did like them very much. Of course, none of the other GM divisions liked them very much either. Uh, but anyway, we were, I've worked on some Saturns, and the first Saturn I ever saw, you just about had to pull the engine out of it to get the alternator off of it. That was ridiculous. Um, and so on and so forth. I could talk about Saturns for a while, but this is a Saturn, and it's sitting out there. And, uh, you know, I got, I got some Saturn stories I could tell. This Mustang I spotted over there, a beautiful little old car that's being restored over at the local body shop. You might also notice it has directional tires on it. If you're going to rotate directional tires, you always got to go side to side. You can't go front. I'm sorry, not side to side. You got to go front to back. You can't go side to side. Do not go side to side. Go front to back. It's amazing how I can mean to say something and say something else. Now this right here was an older model Asian car, Acura or something. I can't remember. And this bushing was totally shot. And this bolt had rusted to the point to where it was part of this sleeve in the center of this thing. It was a disaster. And we were trying to get this thing out of there. Furthermore, even when we did get it out of there, we found out there was no bushing available. And so what I did was I actually drew this schematic of what the bushing needed to look like and the length I and mean, how much it needed. Of course, I needed this, uh, I basically needed this dimension more than I needed that one. You know what I'm saying, but I was goofy when I drew the thing and I knew better than that. Anyway, the point is, I found another bushing from the parts store that was very, very similar. The diameter of it was important because it had to, you know, connect to something that way. And uh, this was important. And by the time I got through, I had taken another bushing and manufactured one to get this car back on the road. This is a car killer. If you can't get this thing fixed, you're not going to be able to drive the car. It's going to be dead. It's going to be sitting there. And it's going, you know, even if you do try to drive it, it's going to be all over the road and everything because it doesn't have good steering and everything. But anyway, that was something I had to fabricate to get this thing going again. This is not a car killing failure, but it's some of the easiest job you'll ever do whenever it comes to front end work. I just love doing these. Uh, you got to learn to, you got to assemble them right because I have had students that would you know, put the, these in the wrong order. You know, I would show them, you know, you're basically going to have the sleeve, then you're going to have a metal washer, the rubber, and then the, 
the sway bar, and then the rubber, and then the metal washer, and then notice this is a self-locking nut and all that, and, you, and that just makes it for a whole lot uh, better deal, and I kind of enjoy doing those, you know. This is a funny little thing I saw. Uh, wife says she parked next to a car that like a stoned vampire, and that's a 59 Chevrolet. <laughs> I always thought even when I was a little boy those things looked funny. You know, I, mean, I, I discovered America in 1957. I remember a lot of these cars, and I knew people that had them for years after, you know, after they, you know, after they were built. Now this is a special adapter that's required on some vehicles to check fuel pressure because they didn't put a fuel pressure tap on it. And I had bought a 180 or 480 dollar Mac tool uh, fuel injector kit, and basically it had a little thing to replace the banjo bolt. Uh, with a little coupler you could put your, you could connect your uh, fuel pressure gauge to and that was handy as a short pocket. Notice in a wheel alignment issue on this old car, sometimes in an old photo you'll see something. Look at that. That's what you call, that's a good illustration of a negative camber. So I don't know how long they had to drive that before they wore that tire out. I saw a vehicle with a really serious bad negative camber on the left rear on a new SUV driving down the road the other day or a later model. Now when all the valves are open, they call that overlap. Uh, they're they're going to have some overlap because they want the incoming uh, exhaust, I mean incoming intake, to shove what's left of the burned exhaust gas out. And then when the, both valves, all the valves are closed, you got your fire event and all that kind of thing. That's a little short piece right there. Two Mercedes E, uh oh, I meant to put 320, I put 220, that's the 320. I had to put uh, motor mounts and a tie rod. Notice the bent tie rod and the collapsed motor mounts. Now this was a pretty big job that that boy did. He had to pull the exhaust off and a bunch of other stuff to get to that, but that car felt a whole lot better. You couldn't feel the engine in the frame and all that. This was when a shiny Chevy tailgate bow tied my Explorer when I was sitting at a drive through I just figured I'd snap a shot of this. It makes my Explorer look like a Chevrolet, doesn't it? Well, Let's do this. Have a great week, and hey, let's be careful out there, all right?